Hey, hello everybody. Welcome to Viva Mondo's webinar. Uh, today we are traveling all the way to the USA. Uh, we are going to Western Kentucky. As you can see on the screen here, uh, Western Kentucky University are here to give you some information um, about affordable studies in the US and a lot more. Um, a little bit about us, of course, Viva Mondo, we are here to help host the event today. Um, we are here to answer your questions at the very end of the webinar. Please do feel free to use the Q&A box right at the bottom of our screens um, for your own questions. Like I said, we will get to those at the very end. Um, we actually exist mainly to help students with information and details for studying abroad. That could be visa advice, that could be application details, lifestyle tips. That's what we're here to do today. Um, all right, I haven't really got much else to, to, to say, so I will hand the floor over to you, Bryson. All right, thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you are watching. My name is Bryson Keltner, and I'm so excited to join you today um, from Bowling Green, Kentucky in the United States. I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, so today I'll be talking a little bit about funding your experience, funding your studies in the United States, and then also giving a brief overview of my university, Western Kentucky. And then I do have a guest joining me today. He's gonna to talk a little bit about his global experience momentarily, uh, but first, Kazi, do you wanna come on and introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon again, depending on where you are. So my name, as Bryson said, is Kazi, but my that's a nickname that everybody calls me. My real name is Kazan Taylor. I am a junior here at Western Kentucky. I have a minor in finance and uh, I have a major in finance and a minor in economics, and I will be sharing my global experiences and stuff like that today with you. All right, thank you, Kazi. A little bit more about me. I am originally from Kentucky and I am an alum of WKU. I studied English and journalism while here as a student. Uh, and we talk a lot about global learning experiences at WKU. We consider that part of our, our WKU experience. So my global learning experience was studying abroad for a semester on a ship. So I traveled around the world on this ship and did my studies that way. Uh, and then after graduating from WKU, I went and interned for six months in England doing media and communications. Um, so that's my experience. Again, we hope that you hope have a global learning experience if you come to WKU or just come and study with us in the United States. So let's go on and get started. Um, so again, we are WKU. We're all about global learning experiences. I'll get more to that in just a moment. But first, let's have an overview of what we'll be talking about today. I'll talk about the tuition and fee structure at most American schools, so you can navigate that well when deciding on where to go. I'll talk a little bit about scholarships and other financial aid in most US schools, so you can keep that in mind as well. I know finances often play a big role in deciding where you will go to school, um, so I hope that is helpful for you. I'll talk about some common criteria uh, for scholarships and applications, some tips, some things you need to avoid when applying for scholarships. I'll talk about some outside funding. And then again, I'll talk about WKU in general and the scholarships that we have to offer. So again, thank you so much for being here. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, so first, let me just say, I know it can be quite daunting to consider going to a different school in a different country for your academic study. It is daunting. And then especially in the US, there are just so many options. You know, there are 50 states and then there are about 4,000 institutions that grant degrees in the US. So I know that's just a wild number, but hopefully considering the finances, considering the scholarship options, uh, that can help you start to narrow it down. So let's talk about understanding the tuition and fees first. So first off, when you see tuition, when you see that on your university or your college's website when applying, the tuition is just the cost of the classes. It's what it costs to be there as a student for a semester or for an academic year, depending on how they have that set up. But there are several fees that will be associated with the tuition, and you can see a list of those there. Now, some universities, some schools, colleges will require all of these things, and it is a certain set fee for each. Some of them will not be required. Some of them will be optional, uh, and they obviously vary as far as how much each of these fees will cost. But I do want to distinguish that 
uh, there will be usually an estimated fee cost on the university's website. So just an estimation of what you will pay for the year for all of these associated fees. And I also want to distinguish that your school will have what is called an I-20 cost. So if you're not familiar with an I-20, that is the official document that you will receive as an international student from your school. And basically you'll take that document to your visa interview. Um, so that's the thing that says, you know, this student has been accepted to this school. Well, in order to obtain an I-20, you'll have to show um, an amount in your, um, in your account that basically says you can afford to come to the school for one year. So that amount will be the cost of tuition and then an estimated cost of all of these different fees. Um, so that's how it works at every university in the United States. Um, so that will be the case. So that's just something to take into mind when you're considering which school you will go to. I also want to distinguish a little bit about uh, common admissions requirements aside from different scholarships because some scholarships will be automatic. Uh, you won't have to do any additional applications at your schools, but some scholarships will require an additional application. So these are common requirements for applications to a school themselves. So you'll obviously have to submit your transcript, your marks. Uh, you'll usually have to submit an English proficiency, depending on where in the world you are, maybe a standardized test. It kind of depends, but that can be different from scholarship applications. But now let's talk about financial aid and scholarships. There are several different ways uh, to gain financial aid. Uh, most you know, colleges and universities in the US will offer some kind of scholarships uh, through specifically their school, but there are outside funding opportunities too sometimes. So um, a lot of governments in different countries will do sponsorships. So they will sponsor students to go and study in the United States. Um, but then also you can get sponsored by businesses sometimes. Uh, you can get sponsored by outside outliers. And I'll get to that just in a moment. But first, let's define a scholarship. So I'm just going to read this. A scholarship is a form of student financial aid that does not need to be repaid. Selection of scholarship recipients is usually based on a set of criteria such as academic, athletic, or artistic merit. Grants and scholarships are often called gift aid because they are free money. They're financial aid that does not have to be repaid. Grants are often need-based, while scholarships are usually merit-based. So something I want to point out are those three words in the middle of this, academic, athletic, and artistic, the three A's. Um, so most schools will have some kind of academic scholarship, again, that is solely based on your merit, your marks, uh, your academics. But uh, the athletic and the artistic merit will usually go, you'll have a different approach to achieving those scholarships. Athletic scholarships, um, often those are full rides, but sometimes they are not, but that usually requires some form of tryout. So if you're in a different country, that will usually consist of some form of video, um, basically audition. And then autistic merit, that will usually require some form of audition or portfolio submission as well. So a little different from the regular academic scholarships. But let me get to the academic scholarships. That's what I'll be highlighting mostly today. Um, so scholarships, I'll give you tips for just a moment. Um, but then there's also sponsorships. Like I said, some universities will accept government sponsorships from government agencies. You can get business sponsorships. Um, a lot of schools will offer assistantships. So that's kind of like a scholarship with uh, kind of an attached caveat that you will do some work within a department once you arrive to the university as you are studying. Uh, a lot of students will end up taking out a loan uh, to pay for their, their academic study. Uh, and then a lot of students will do a work study at the university or college as well. Um, so a work study is basically when you work on campus uh, as a job, uh, US basically regulates that students from other countries can work up to 20 hours per week on campus. Uh, that's a US law. So you can't work off campus, you can work on campus, uh, but there are several different options for that. You can work in residence halls, you can work uh, in counseling and testing centers, in restaurants on campus. Mr. Kazi here uh, works for Residence Life, so I'm sure he'll explain about that in just a moment. So those are some other ways besides just scholarships to help you fund your education in the US. But again, we're talking about scholarships mostly. So some common criteria, criteria for scholarships uh, are a personal essay. So that might be some kind of prompt that the scholarship 
application will give you and you'll have to write an essay. You might have to submit a resume, so things that you have accomplished. You might have to submit letters of recommendation from someone who has worked with you or someone at your school. And you might have to show your academic transcript of marks. So these are not going to be all applications that require all of these things. Uh, they will kind of be, you know, one thing or the other sometimes, but these are the most common. So some myths about scholarships. Number one is only highest performing re students receive scholarships. So only the best of the best ever receive a scholarship. And that's not always true. While those students probably have more access to more scholarships, um, a lot of schools will offer scholarships to students as long as they're a pretty decent student. Um, so don't let that discourage you. If you're not top of your class, you make the best grades in the class ever you might still have an opportunity for scholarships. Another myth is it is easy to earn a scholarship that will cover full tuition. Um, I'll be completely transparent with you and, and real with you. A lot of schools will offer a full tuition scholarship. However, there will be very limited amounts of those scholarships. So maybe one, two or three scholarships for the entire academic year for students. So they are a little more difficult to achieve uh, if you're going to a school that offers those. However, most schools will offer scholarships and most schools will let you stack scholarships to a certain extent. And what that means is you can apply for multiple scholarships and use all of them together. So maybe you won't receive one scholarship that covers the entire amount of tuition and fees, but by stacking several of them, you'll be able to hopefully knock it down to where it's at least affordable or even possibly um, to cover your full tuition. That'll be a little more difficult, but it is entirely possible depending on what school you are applying to. And then the last myth is searching and applying for scholarships is too much work. I wouldn't say that's the case. It just takes a little effort on your part. So I would recommend going to the website for whatever school to which you're applying. And usually they'll have a link somewhere that talks about financial aid or scholarships. Check out that information and then ask questions. Ask the admissions counselors at the schools to where you're applying. Um, ask the people who are on chat links and on you know, the emails for your schools. Um, ask some questions about those scholarships to make sure you're good and informed. Um, and then make sure you have enough information to apply for that scholarship. So now some must do's when applying for scholarships. Try to apply early because the earlier you apply, the more kind of idea you have of how much money you will receive. Um, so that will let you know, okay, I need X amount of dollars more in order to be able to afford my, my academic study in the US. So I need to apply for some more scholarships. Um, proofread your scholarship applications well. I cannot express this enough. You know, we. Um, see a lot of applications just to school, not even scholarships that have misspellings um, and whatnot. So when applying for scholarships, that can really deter your scholarship committee um, from giving you those full marks if a lot of things are misspelled or a lot of punctuation is really off. So I would recommend having, you know, a couple of different other people besides yourself read over your scholarship application before you submit it just to make sure there are no major mistakes. Another is to make a list of everything required for that scholarship and check it off as you complete it to make sure that you have submitted everything that is needed for that scholarship. Completely read all the requirements and guidelines. Um, you might have missed something and that's very important that you fulfill all of the requirements. Take your scholarship award letter to your visa interview. Um, so if you go to your visa interview and say, I received this scholarship to this school to study this um, subject, they might be a little more apt to award you that, that student visa um, because it shows that you are financially able to go to this school. So that's another important tip. Um, so now some mistakes to avoid when applying for scholarships. Make sure that you hit the deadline on time. If you miss the deadline, your school is probably not going to give you an extension or um, you know, give you that scholarship. Um, if you leave out required documentation for the scholarship, if you don't fulfill it, they also probably won't give you the scholarship. Um, if you're applying for scholarships in which you're not eligible, if, eligible, if it's you know, clearly defined that you have to have a certain grade point average or you have to have you know, two letters of recommendation and you only submit one, um, you're, you're probably not going to be 
um, given that scholarship either. Um, and then also beware of scams. I know there are a lot of different kind of false um, false things for scholarships out there. So when you're applying for scholarships, make sure, make sure you're going through trusted entities. Um, so make sure you're going for scholarships directly through your, your school or through trusted um, you know, vetted sites. Um, so don't just you know, Google a, a scholarship and something with a weird web address pops up. I probably wouldn't trust them with your, your classified information. Also, always remember, be original when you are writing your scholarship essays. So if a scholarship requires an essay for the application, uh, that essay is how you stand out with that scholarship application. And this is good advice too, if your school to which you're applying in general also requires an essay or short answer. Um, that scholarship committee is going to be reviewing several, several scholarship essays. And if you write just a kind of basic, I'm gonna get through this scholarship application essay as quick as possible, just answer the information and don't really put a lot of your personality or originality into it, um, it's going to go into a pile with all of the other essays that are very similar. So try to be original with that. Um, the example that I always use is a personal one. Uh, I was applying for a scholarship to when I was going to university and the scholarship prompt for the essay was, what would you do if you were not afraid of failure? And I wrote a poem entitled, If I Weren't Afraid of Failure. Um, so I had this poem in my scholarship essay. And then at the end of the poem, I wrote a paragraph that basically said, if I were afraid of failure, I wouldn't have written a poem for my scholarship application essay. Um, and I got the full scholarship amount. Um, so just try to be original when going through those essays, try to make yourself stand out and your scholarship committee will probably appreciate that. Most institutions will send you an email when they receive your scholarship application, some will not, um, but be checking your email and then also check your spam or junk folders in your email because sometimes when you get kind of an automated response from a university, sometimes it might go to that spam or junk folder. Um, so check those as well. Email the institution with questions about, um, you know, the application. That's key because uh, you won't know sometimes until you ask. And that's just to make sure that you have all of the right information, that you can actively answer all components of the scholarship um, application. And that also shows the university that you're very, very interested. Some scholarships will be automatic, while some will require an application, like I said. So an example of an automatic merit scholarship is our Tippy scholarship at WKU. I'm going to talk about that very momentarily when I start talking about my school. Um, all right, so again, I appreciate you all being here. I see a couple things in the chat there. Um, I'm very excited to answer your questions very soon, and so is Kazi. But first, let me start to talk a bit about my school, which is Western Kentucky University. So Western Kentucky University was established in 1906, so we have been around for quite a while. Here is our wonderful campus. So a thing about WKU is we were built on a hill. Um, we were actually known as the Hilltoppers. That is kind of our, um, our thing. So the great thing about being on a hill is no matter where you are on the hill, you can usually get to where you're going within about 15 minutes because you can go around the hill, over the hill. Um, it is a pretty large campus, but it's not super spread out, which makes it nice for traveling. Here's just a glance at WKU. One big thing I like to mention is kind of the international presence that we have. So I mentioned earlier that WKU is all about global learning experiences. We want you to have some form of global learning experience whether that's study abroad, whether that is getting involved in international clubs or organizations, whether that's getting involved in our refugee population here in Bowling Green, um, we're all about, you know, global learning. Um, and we actually have several different nationalities represented within our student body, and we take a, a large, a lot of pride in that. Um, WKU has very small class sizes compared to its student population. So we have about 20,000 students, um, but our average class size is only 24 students. And that means you will be able to raise your hand and ask questions. Your professor will know your name. You don't won't be just a face in the room. And I think that allows for a lot more personalized learning experience. Um, as far as where we are, we're in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And we are known as 
on one of the most beautiful campuses in the southern United States. We're in a very rural area surrounded by a lot of rolling hills and farmland and then our campus itself um, is absolutely gorgeous. You can see there in that photo the cherry blossom trees. So for our 100th year anniversary we planted 100 cherry blossom trees on campus um, so in the springtime when those bloom out it will take your breath away. We are located in Kentucky, obviously. If you're not super familiar with Kentucky, there it is on the map. It's the area in red. And the great thing about Kentucky, I think, is we're kind of centrally located. So we're not so far north that we get feet and feet of snow. We're not so far south that it's unbearably hot all the time. We get a very nice mix of seasons. We experience all four seasons very well. And then also you can kind of see there, we're pretty close to um, Nashville, Tennessee. So we're one hour away from Nashville. Nashville is the international airport that you'll probably come into to join us at WKU. It's also the music capital of the world, in case you didn't know. Uh, so again, Bowling Green is a pretty rural series, uh, city. We have about 67,000 people besides our WKU population, um, but it is very beautiful. Kentucky itself is known as the horse capital of the world. So we have a lot of horse racing. There's a lot of farmland around with horses, again, very beautiful area. WKU is a big sports school. So sports are a huge part of culture for a lot of universities in the United States. And WKU definitely falls into that. So we are a division one sports school and people who don't even like sports go to a lot of our sporting events. It's kind of like a hangout opportunity. Um, so that's a good way to you know, have some fun and meet some friends. And then over there on the side peeking out is Big Red. So Big Red is our mascot at WKU. No one quite knows what Big Red is. That's kind of the allure of him, um, but he's, he's a fun thing that goes around at the sporting events. So he'll sometimes eat your head at like the football game. He's a lot of fun. Um, so again, big sports school, and then our international population plays a big role in our student athletes. So we have students from all over the world playing for us. Um, big international presence, and then also there are over 300 different student organizations and groups on campus to get involved in. So there are um, academic organizations like biology club and business fraternities. There's huge Greek life for fraternities and sororities. There are um, organizations that are for fundraising for different causes. There's intramural sports. So if you don't wanna play a sport for the university, uh, and be competitive for them. You can play sports just for fun. We have that. So there's a lot going on on campus. And I will say besides sports, we have a big emphasis on humanities at WKU. So we're constantly having different performances, different theater performances, concerts, that kind of thing. So there's always something going on on the Hill. At this point, I wanna break for just a moment because I know I've been talking a lot already and go to Mr. Kazi here, who is again, a current student at WKU. So Kazi just wants to share a little bit about his experience at WKU being from the Bahamas. Thank you, Bryson. So like Bryson said, I am from the Bahamas, not Southern Providence specifically. And I came here in 2019. I was in one of these fairs as well. And ever since then, the experience has been amazing. So when I do presentations, um, the most common question I get is, why would I leave the Bahamas to come here at Western? Um, I will say that it helped me in like a tremendous way in terms of like my global experiences, getting a different perspective and like my personal growth as well. So with my global experiences, like I've learned a lot of new perspectives. I've tried a lot of new things. Every single time I do a presentation, I talk about how I tried lasagna for the first time when I was here and I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, it's like different music. So you get a, like a different, a different taste of things that are not natural to you back home. And I feel as though that's how you grow as a person. Um, you also learn the way that people think about your country, like the, the thoughts they have about your country, the topics. And that way you get to gauge and see, oh, that's what people think and then that way you get to teach them as well while learning about it so that's a cool experience as well and it's something that you you can't get back home um it's something everybody know home is home but it's something that you you can't you can't like replace in terms of like different perspectives um you get like a real world experience 
especially with me coming from the Bahamas to the United States, we do a lot of things differently. The terminology is different. These so are like words I would use to describe some things. They would use a totally different word. So that way I like expand my vocabulary as well. And you also achieve like intercultural communication. And that's, I think, like a really, really important skill. If you could learn how to like meet with people from different backgrounds, different areas, and, you know, get to bond with them as well. Um, in terms of like my personal growth, I've gotten like really, really, really more confident in myself. I would say that I was shy. Um, you could put air quotes on shy, but yeah, like I've really grown in myself um, doing presentations like this, meeting new people, meeting new friends. Like I've met a lot of a lot of my best friends here. The reason why I chose WKU, and I think it's the best school ever, is because of a lot of reasons, really. Um, it's diversity, as Bryson talked about, um, the food options, and then like the campus culture and stuff like that. So in terms of diversity, there are over like a thousand plus us international students here and as Bryson mentioned and it was in one of the slides there are 65 international countries represented here 65 and one of the coolest things is if you look right there on the that's our honors college where we hold some of our honor students and international students that's where they have a flag that represents like where you're from so it was like really really cool to like walk past and I see my Bahamian flag you know flying so high and I was like Wow, like you really feel like you're your family here. And that's a really big thing for international students. Um, like Bryson said, there are like 50 nationalities represented in our student body in terms of like campus clubs. So you could always find a way to get involved. You have food options. That was another big reason. <laughs> Everybody loves food. <laughs> I love food. Um, we have like a lot of food options on campus. We have like a Chick-fil-A, we have multiple food courts, you have a Denny's, you have a Red Zone, you have a Burrito Bowl. Some of these things you can't get back home where I'm from in the Bahamas. So, you know, I take advantage of it every day that I can. Um, so that is a really good option as well. And then just the campus culture and the environment. The campus is always active. There will always be something going on on campus. Like the games are really, really good. I always find myself going to a football game. I always find myself going to a basketball game. And like Bryson said, you don't even have to like the sport. It's like a cool hangar where you come and like you support WKU and like you chill with your friends. Campus culture is awesome. Um, in terms of me, I joined the residence hall um, association. So I am a resident assistant here at WKU. And it has been like a tremendous help on me. So um, I get paid for it. <laughs> That's one of the biggest things. And then I, like, I meet a lot of new people. I've met some of my best friends doing this job. And then I also, I'm an ambassador with um, GLIA, so Global Learning and International Affairs. And it has helped me tremendously as lot, a lot as well. So I've met new people like Bryson. You make a lot of new connections. You meet people from all over the world. I've met people from Brazil. I met people from Honduras. I've even met um, a few Bahamians who I didn't know go here. So it's like a real family atmosphere here at WKU and I would recommend applying here. All right, thank you so much, Kazi, for sharing some of your experience. I really appreciate it. Um, so you've heard a bit about WKU now. So obviously the important things, things about applying and then our scholarship, since we're talking about financial aid today. Uh, so here are the admissions requirements for our undergraduate or our bachelor's degrees um, at WKU. So for those, we will need just a, an online application. We're unfortunately not on the Common App. Uh, if that, That's usually a question, but we have a very quick online application. It takes you very little time at all. We'll need your high school transcript, and we will need at least a 2.5 grade point average on the American scale. So if you send us your transcript, we do all of our evaluations in-house. You don't have to get that evaluated somewhere else, and we'll convert that into the American scale for you. Uh, we'll also need an English proficiency exam if you are from a country where English is not predominantly spoken, or if you did not do your entire um, high school academic career in English, well, we'll need that exam. So you can see those different exams listed. Uh, the most common two we, we see are the TOEFL or the IELTS. Um, we'll also need an application fee, um, and that's pretty much it as far as undergraduate application. Um, so pretty quick and easy. 
I will say it's a bit different for our graduate admissions. Uh, so for if you're going for a master's, every graduate program at WKU has different graduate admissions requirements. So first off, we will still need that English proficiency exam. Um, it's a little bit higher, so a TOEFL of 79 or an IELTS of 6.5. Um, but with that being said, it depends on the program for what else you will need. You'll, you'll need a transcript from your undergraduate degree. Um, so you, you will have to complete a bachelor's degree in order to be admitted to our graduate school. Uh, but then some school, some programs require um, a GRE exam, some require a GMAT. So for example, if you would like to do computer science at our school, you would need at least a 290 on the GRE. So some will require those, those additional um, exams. Some will require a letter of recommendation, some will require a resume, it really depends. But if you look on our website at our different programs, every program is clearly outlined on what is required for that graduate program. So that would be my advice is to go on there uh, and look. I do also want to talk about our IPASS program. So our IPASS is the International Pathway to Academic Success. Um, and what that is, is basically a program for first year undergraduate students to kind of enable their success at WKU. I will say too, if you don't quite meet our admissions requirements, but you're almost there. So for example, if you have an IELTS of six or 5.5 and we need a 6.0, um, you can actually still be admitted into the pathway and then begin um, going on with your other classes after. Um, so that at that point, the pathway is required. If, you're, if you do meet our admission standards, the pathway is not required, but we still highly encourage it. Uh, so basically this pathway, starts you off with success at WKU. It takes some core classes that you would need to take anyway for your, your undergraduate degree. So it's not gonna add any additional time to your, your time here. But uh, you would take classes about basically how to be a student in the US. Uh, it would help you kind of engage and assimilate to um, university life at WKU. So it might include classes about US pop culture. It might include classes about research uh, in school to basically start you off well um, and again, it does not require any additional time. It will just take up the first year out of your four year experience in an undergraduate degree. So I would highly recommend the IPASS program. Um, we like to be completely transparent about our tuition and fees. So I did, like I said earlier, there is the tuition rate for a school and then there are the fees and the fees are usually an estimated cost. So you can see there our tuition for both undergraduate and graduate studies. And then we estimate uh, your living expenses out there for you. Those bottom totals are our I-20 costs, like I mentioned. So that would be the amount you would have to show in your account in order to obtain your I-20 from us to take to your visa interview. Um, so again, every school will have that I-20 cost. However, I will say if you receive any scholarships from WKU, um, that scholarship amount will be subtracted from that I-20 cost. So for example, if you receive a scholarship from us that is $10,000 and you're an undergraduate student, instead of showing $41,000 uh, for your I-20, you would only have to show about $31,000. So any scholarships would be subtracted. All right, so scholarships at WKU, which is probably what you're waiting for, and that's, you know, what we're talking about today, scholarships and financial aid. We have a brand new TIPI scholarship is what we call it, and this is specifically from students from the Bahamas, like Kazi, students from Nepal, students from Malaysia, and students from any African country. So if you are from one of those places, we have a special scholarship for you. Um, the TIPI scholarship, and it is completely automatic based on your grade point average, so based on your transcript of marks. If you have a grade point average from 3.0 to 3.49, you would automatically receive a scholarship of about $5,500. No additional application, none of those scholarship essays I talked about, nothing, it is automatic. If you have a 3.5 to a 4.0, you would automatically receive about $13,500 as well. So you can see the award amount there, and then you can see what your tuition would be with that scholarship alone. And you can usually stack some additional scholarships on top of that. Um, again, if you have questions about grade point averages, we average those for you. We take your transcript and we go class by class to convert every grade that you receive into the American scale, which is on a 4.0. 
So aside from TIPI scholarships, we have our WKU Merit Scholarships. These are open to students no matter where you're from. Um, as long as you have a 3.0 grade point average, you can get one of these scholarships. Um, usually students will receive up to around $8,000 um, as a maximum of those scholarships, but um, it depends on what your grade point average is for what you'll get. And then also we have scholarships through our top dollar system. So top dollar is a portal system. And after you are accepted to WKU, you would receive information on that. Um, and basically you would log on and there's a database of scholarships and you might put in some different criteria about yourself, like where you're from and what you're studying and scholarships based on that will pop up and you can apply to those additionally on top of those merit scholarships. And some of those will require those additional applications. Some will require essays like I talked about. Um, if you were from an OAS state, so usually a country that is um, in this hemisphere in South America, Central America, Canada, Mexico, um, you would be eligible for the OAS scholarship. The OAS scholarship is $11,000 per year. Um, and that also requires an additional application. Um, the deadline for that each year is June 15th. Um, so we can give you some more information on that. And then assistantships. So if you're going for a graduate degree at our university, we don't provide scholarships, we provide assistantships, like I mentioned earlier. So that assistantship will involve you working closely with an academic department or um, a unit here at WKU. And for doing that work, you would receive um, that assistantship money. Some of them are complete and full assistantships, so you would fund your entire degree. Um, some of them are partial. It kind of depends on what the program is. Um, so this is a lot of information that I've thrown at you today. I know so much information about, you know, funding and scholarships and financial aid and then WKU, a lot of to take in. So what I would recommend is chatting with us. If you go to our website, I'll give you that website in just a moment. You can do a little chat at the bottom and chat with a current student um, and ask any questions that you may have. Uh, also talk with one of our global learning ambassadors like Kazi. Um, so we have several of them. This is actually last year's crew. So we need to get updated pictures, I apologize. But the global learning ambassadors are there to help you. Uh, they are help to, there to help you get to WKU, answer any questions that you have, give you a real perspective of a real international student for, um, experience here. Um, we have those students available on chat with us. And then you can also make an appointment with them if you'd like to Skype or FaceTime or Zoom with one of our current students, you can absolutely do that. Uh, whether you're, you're considering WK or not, or whether you just say, hey, I wanna talk to someone about studying in the US in general, they'd be happy to talk to you. I'd also encourage you to get connected with us on our social media. So we are at WKU Global on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We're constantly posting cool cultural content um, from WKU, and you'll get to see all kinds of our current students on there. Um, here is our information. Again, so much information. I'm about to open it up for questions if you have them, uh, but also if you think of anything after the, the webinar here or you're watching the recorded version, feel free to reach out to us. So our website is wku.edu slash international. You can email us at applyinternational at wku.edu. And then again, reach out to us on um, social media as well. We're happy to, to chat with you there at WKU Global. So I guess we'll open it up to questions. Awesome, okay, thank you so much, Bryson. And from you, Kazi, that was a great uh, presentation. And I think a lot of information was thrown out there, <laughs> but we do have quite a few questions that we can also get through. Um, so I'm gonna kick start this off with the first question. Uh, will I gain help with accommodation advice? Sure. So with whatever school you're applying to, um, ask your admissions counselor, ask when you are emailing um, and applying, um, they will have information about where to stay on campus. Some universities will require you to stay on campus to a certain extent. So for example, our university, um, we have an age limit. So if you're doing an undergraduate degree, you would usually stay on campus uh, your first few semesters, and then you would be able to choose whether you would like to continue staying on campus or live off campus. Um, but your admissions counselors, your people working for that school would have all of that information for you. So I promise you wouldn't be just in the dark of where am I supposed to stay when I come to study in the U.S.? 
Perfect. Thank you for that answer. Next question. Is there a specific essay I need to do to apply to scholarships? I think you've kind of touched on this. Yeah, so not every scholarship application will be the same. Um, some will require essays, some will not. And then it, it will differ for different applications for what you might need to write about. Um, I know a lot of them will have something to do with like, why do you want to study in the United States? Or why do you want to study this specific degree? Um, what are your aspirations, that kind of thing. So maybe even before you start applying, if you want to, you know, start crafting some answers to those basic questions that might help you with writing the, the scholarship application essays in general. Perfect. All right, next question. Uh, will I be able to meet potential employers at your school and have a chance to network? Um, so at our school, yes. So we do have some different opportunities um, on campus where, you know, folks from uh, outside organizations will come in. I will say that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, students in the U.S. cannot work off campus while they are a student in the U.S. Um, that is a U.S. law because you're on a student visa, not a work visa. So you can work up to 20 hours uh, on campus. However, with that being said, something I haven't mentioned is OPT. Um, and that basically is a program that allows students to work in the United States um, up to a year, um, in some circumstances longer than that, after they graduate. So you would be able to work in your field for that time and get that hands-on experience. And we do have um, a lot of connections for that while you're, while you're here as a student. So for example, one of our advisors in our office, um, basically his main role is helping students get to where they want to go. Um, and he is very, very good at what he's, he does. His name is George. He's basically a rock star. He's the best. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and there's also a question here for Kazi. Um, can we attend student events currently in person? Kazi, how did you find mingling during COVID times? Um, so, yeah, um, currently we can attend events last year it was a little rough in terms of that because um COVID was at a high 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 level I mean it still is but yeah um this year we attend more in-person events um in terms of what I do I keep um my distance it depends on so if you're my friend and I'm with you a lot you will sit next to me but if you're like a stranger I keep my distance so I still practice safe guidelines but yeah, we do have a lot of in-person events this year. And that's a good point too, Kazi. So we, you know, recognize that COVID is still, you know, pretty rapid, but we have a lot of guidelines um, regulated by the state here in Kentucky and then also just WKU in general. So for example, if you're indoors anywhere on campus, a mask is required. Um, and we also try to practice that social distancing, like Kazi said. So I promise it's not just a free for all here with COVID raging. Everything is like, you know, all people all up on each other. But we do still have those in-person events just with within reason and with guidelines. Thanks. And to follow on to that, um, we do have another question about classes. Are they online or are they in person this year? So they are in person um, with some caveats. So some of them are kind of a hybrid model. So sometimes you meet, sometimes you uh, would Zoom and do online. And then we always do have online options, completely online. Um, so we even do have some students that start their, their journey at WKU online. So for a semester or two, they might stay in their home country um, and you know do that completely online and then join us after being a student for a year. That's an option. Um, and we also recognize that a lot of embassies are you know pretty slow to give visas right now. A lot of them are backed up. So it might be physically impossible for students to join us uh, you know their first semester because they can't get a student visa in time. And that's totally fine. We have that online option so you can get started and not delay your graduation date just because you can't join us maybe the first semester you wanted to. Thanks. And, and another question I'm talking about COVID-19. Um, are there any particular issues if I haven't been vaccinated for COVID-19? Are you a campus which requires this of students? Uh, so we do not require the COVID-19 vaccine for our students. Um, however, we do offer that to all students completely for free. So there is a clinic here on campus that gives us vaccines. If you would like to be vaccinated, you can absolutely do that on campus, but it is not required. Um, as far as coming into the U.S., we do require students, um, if they are not vaccinated, to, um, you know, 
basically not come to our events quite yet, just to make sure that you're good from travel and whatnot. Um, but it's it's not required for the vaccine. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess lastly, what are the application deadlines for fall 22 or even this year? Okay, so we actually have rolling admission, um, and that means that we don't technically have deadlines for when you have to apply. Um, we could even admit you, you know, the day before classes start. I would say that is probably not a good idea whatsoever. Um, so we would recommend just to make sure that you have time to apply, get accepted, get your student visa, apply for additional scholarships, to apply, to apply um, you know, anywhere from three to four months before the start of each semester. Um, and that's just kind of a general recommendation. Um, so for the spring of 22, um, our spring semester begins at the end of January, so you absolutely still have time to apply, get accepted, do all of those things. Um, and then our fall semester begins in the end of August. Um, so that's, you know, I would recommend making sure you apply, get accepted in the summer of 22. Um, we do have winter and summer terms as well. Those are usually short terms. However, we recommend our first time students starting in the main semester because that's when we have our international student orientations. Uh, so you can really get assimilated to campus before you begin your classes. Um, so I would recommend, you know, starting end of January or end of August. Brilliant. Thank you so much, guys, for your presentation. I actually have a question for Kazi. Um, is there anything that particularly stood out for you in your time at WKU? Is there anything that you want to tell students of why they should come? Or apply? Yeah. yeah, so I kind of like touch on this in my presentation. So I think as international students, we have this fear that um, people won't be as um, accepting of us. Like when we come here, because we're in like a strange, well, not a strange place, but we're in an oncoming place and we don't know much people. So the biggest thing that I found out is that, especially here at Western, that people are very, very welcoming. So once you come in, they open up their arms to you and it's like a whole family atmosphere here. So when I talk about diversity and they really, really, really help you from the moment you step your foot on this campus to the moment you leave. So that is why I encourage you to apply. And then we do have um, global ambassadors who will be with you every step of the way. They will answer every call you have, every concern you have, and they will basically be your best friend while you're on campus. So I highly encourage. Okay, thank you so much. That's such a sweet thing to say. And actually it, it really does, it's a reflection of, of your time at WKU, which is brilliant. Um, are there any last words you wanna put out there, Bryson? I just want to say thank you for tuning in, whether you're, you're tuning in live or you're watching the recorded version. I appreciate your time and your interest. I hope you gain some valuable information about financial aid in the U.S. and then some information about WKU. Um, and I really hope that you reach out to us and, and um, are interested in joining us in our Hilltopper family. Amazing. Thank you guys so much for um, this presentation. If you guys have any questions, like I said, they will be in touch with you uh, very, very soon. And um, we will also be sending the video to you to watch on demand um, all year like, round, if you like. Um, and those of you on Facebook, we can also send you the videos too. Um, any, anything else from you two? I think you've kind of covered all the, the bases. Uh, I think I'm good. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you guys for your time. Thank you for coming and hopefully see you soon. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Bye, everyone. Bye.